Hi, uh, welcome to the functional section. If you're like me, you essentially grew up in object-oriented programming. That's what you're used to thinking. It's important to be aware, however, that it's really just a way of thinking about problems. It's not exclusive to a particular programming language. With object-oriented programming, we think about our programming problems as made up of objects with certain properties and they interact with each other in different ways and they have different relationships with each other. With functional programming on the other hand, we are instead thinking about, problem, about problems primarily in terms of functions. We combine functions to create new functions. Programming will usually give you a lot of flexibility with respect to manipulating and combining functions. I would however not characterize Julia as a functional programming language. Today we associate that with languages such as OCaml, Haskell, and Scheme, and a more modern incarnation will be Clojure, which attempts to avoid mutability at all costs and emphasize functions at the expense of traditional constructs like loops, etc. And Julia can be like that because it's intended to be an efficient language for numerical and scientific computing. And that kind of problem domain, large matrices are important and you have to be able to operate on them efficiently. And that's very hard to achieve uh, with high performance if matrices are immutable. So this first uh, video in the section is called higher order functions. And that's because higher order functions is one of the most central topics for functional programming, at least what we can relate to here in Julia. Of course, not everything related to functional programming is available to you in Julia. Higher order functions are basically functions we take other functions as arguments and they can return functions. So we're not just having functions that are taking integers or arrays or strings as arguments, but actual function objects. So a common example of higher order functions, at least if you look at examples on Wikipedia, which I, I copied in this case, is called uh, twice. So that's really just to demonstrate uh, the, the idea. So you can see here I'm, I'm using the, the Atom browser or a Juno in this case. It's handy when we're going through a number of examples to avoid uh, writing them out. Uh, what's good in this case is that I can, if I write, if I have some code written here, I can evaluate that in the browser. So now I just hit uh, the, the command and enter. I could also hit this button here uh, to perform the same. Anyway, we're going to look at this twice function. It takes in the first argument here is a function and the second is a value. So we're executing this function with the values argument and the return value is then fed to the function again as an argument. So we're performing the function twice. So let's try that out. Now, one of the problems with uh, this case is that we haven't really specified the type. So it doesn't really prevent me if I wrote uh, something which isn't a function as the first argument. I get a runtime error. And that's good in this case because we don't want to continue running. But the error message isn't completely obvious. Uh, so it helps to be more specific. Um, and that's what I'm doing in this case here. I'm saying that the first argument I have to in fact be a function and that the second one's going to be a number. So now if we try to do the same, we should clear the workspace first. And then we can evaluate twice. So this is a bit more helpful error message because 
you can see uh, it says that there is no twice that takes uh, two strings as an argument. So let's continue our example. We have to define some kind of function to use as an argument. And this is this ink. It's pretty simple. It just takes a number and then increases it by one. So this is going to do the one increase uh, twice. So that gives us six. So you can just try another case here and see how that works. So now you got the basic idea. Let's look at some examples from Julia and how uh, higher order functions are used there. Julia comes with a lot of built in higher order functions operating on collections. So I'm hitting the, um, the command T, which allows me to sec select a file in my in the directory that I currently open. To work through these examples, I'm going to create some data. So the range here is going to create an array um, when being fed to filter from 1 to 10. And then filter is going to include only the ones that match uh, even. And in this case, the ones that match odd. So let's try that out. So you can look at the content like that. So you see this is only the even ones included. And just for reference, I'm going to print out a down here. When we go to the next example, demonstrating predicates. I like to do that up here, though. So this just counts the um, we're providing an a predicate, so that's a function that returns a boolean. So we're testing how many are odd in A. So that was zero, as you can see below. And there are five odd ones. As you can see, there has five elements that are all been filtered to be odd. And of course, we don't have to provide an existing function. We can have a, a sort of lambda expression or an anonymous function in line like this. So this says that its function takes one argument. Uh, we're naming it x. And then we're checking if that's larger than 5. We're counting the number that fits that. So there's three elements larger than 5 in A and 2 in B. Maybe I should put B here as well. And this, of course, is equivalent to using the do form. So what the do form here gets um, turned into a function argument as the first argument. So if you are making some of these functions yourself, make sure that you always take the function argument as the first one to be able to support the do form. And when do we use this? Well, um, this is a contrived example because we only have a very simple expression. But if you had multiple lines of code, uh, this would be easier, of course, to use than this form, which is really just when uh, meant for one-liners. And we have some other um, useful things like checking if every element in A matches uh, is odd. If every element is less than 20, well, that's true. Um, not everyone is larger than eight, but there is at least one element which is larger than eight. So that's why that's true. These are uh, reductions. So we're taking a number of elements and turning it into a single number. So this adds up all the elements provided and in this case, we'll multiply each of the elements. And factorial, we're taking, so if we have the factorial, say 10, then it will be 10 times 9, 8, 7, and so all the way down to 1. So this is going to be 3 times 2 times 1. Um, next one, I think I want to show you is taking the finding the, the smallest and largest value. But just to show you that I'm not cheating, I will uh, shuffle A so that, you know, you can see I'm not really just taking the first or, or last element. 
And you see when we have the exclamation mark, it means it's an in place replacement. So A has actually been changed. Let's do that one more time. So now you can see it's been shuffled around. If we don't have an exclamation mark, like for instance, if we're sorting A like that, then it won't actually change the A. You can see that it returned it in sorted order, but if we look at it here, it's still unsorted. So then we can uh, take the maximum and the minimum, and you can see it finds it regardless of where in the array it's located. The examples we looked at so far has involved taking some values as inputs and returning some values as output. But it's also useful to do something for all the elements in a collection, which doesn't take uh, produce any outputs, but produce a side effect, like the print line, which doesn't return anything, but has a side effect of printing something to the console. So this allows us to show you the, the, the content of A in the console. So that's what you saw printed out down here. The final thing I want to show you is that we're now limited to just taking functions as inputs. They can also be um, outputs. So here where this function adder will return a function defined here. And this function will add some number that you provide as an argument to the x. So let's just create that. And so here we're running adder providing for, which gives us a new uh, function in by for. So by for will add for to whatever you provide as an argument. And as you've seen before, there are multiple ways of doing things often in Julia. Uh, if we wanted to have multiple lines and not just this one liner thing, we could create an anonymous function like this. So let's just try that out. This is going to multiply the arguments that you provide. So now we get a function by six is going to multiply anything you provide to it with six. So how can we sum up everything that I've gone through thus far in the video? I gotta say there's not really a central concept for you to remember here. Um, the idea I wanna get across is that we have a lot of high order functions that can operate on collections. And of course, you can really just look these up as you need them. This is really just to set the stage for the next video,